I'm a physician and I work in a public hospital in Oakland, California, and I'm also an anthropologist and I teach at UC Berkeley. As a physician, I'm really interested in what makes us sick and what we can do about it so that we're all healthier. And as an anthropologist, I'm interested in understanding how people make sense of their lives and the world around them, um, including what makes people sick. As a physician, I'm trained to give you a PowerPoint slide presentation that when I'm in the audience, I find a little bit boring. When, as an anthropologist, I'm trained to read you a paper, which when I'm in the audience, I find a little bit boring. So I'm going to do both. <laughs> when I moved to San Francisco to start medical school, I started to get to know the city and some of the inequalities of the city. I noticed differences in neighborhoods. For example, Pacific Heights. Pacific Heights is one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in San Francisco with mansions, some of which have beautiful views of the Golden Gate Bridge. Famous politicians, famous actors, business executives live here. And then another example is Hunter's Point, one of the poorest neighborhoods in San Francisco with public housing and apartment buildings, the Pacific Gas and Electric Plant, and a shipbuilding yard. I remember in anatomy lab the first year of medical school reading an article that showed that the kids in Hunter's Point were five times more likely to die of asthma than kids in the rest of the city. And I started to think more about how social inequalities affect our health. First, I started to think, might it be that people in Hunter's Point don't have health insurance, so they can't see doctors in the first place? Or might it be that families in Hunter's Point don't have enough money to pay for the asthma inhalers that would treat their asthma? And then I started to think about the air quality in the neighborhood and how that might relate to the Pacific Gas and Electric Plant or the shipbuilding yard. And then beyond that, I started to think about a history of institutional racism. And by that, I don't mean individual haters, but rather the way that our society is set up, that our institutions are set up, so that certain groups of people have the political power to say, we don't want that in our neighborhood, and other groups of people don't have the political power to do that. Since that time, I've been searching for answers to how do inequalities affect our health and what can we do about it. This search took me on a journey, um, a year and a half full time living and working with migrant farm workers who are native Mexicans, starting in, in Washington State, picking on a strawberry farm, living in a labor camp, moving to California, pruning vineyards, living in a slum apartment with 19 other people. There were one or two families in each bedroom, a family in the living room, and then I, as the gay physician and anthropologist, literally had the closet. Um, which was good because I, I could close the door and analyze and think about what was going on. Then moving to their home village in the mountains of Oaxaca and then across the border into Arizona and into the border patrol jail after we were apprehended. So the migrant farm workers I lived with taught me several things and I'd like to share three of them with you today. The first is that unequal policies make us sick. And to analyze that, I'd like to read a section from my journal when we were crossing the border. The border town where we stopped in northern Mexico scares me. It's impossible to know which person dressed in dark clothing is an assailant, wanting money from easy targets, and which is a person planning to cross the border. Marcario remarks, people know how to take your money without you even noticing. I push an empty soda bottle into my pocket above my money and I feel a little safe. The cathedral at the center of town has hand-drawn posters covering the inside walls facing the pews, portraying the dangers at the border. Rattlesnakes, scorpions, cacti, dehydration, and assailants. Each poster asks in bold red letters in Spanish, is it worth risking your life? The church has a small side room where people light candles and pray for safe passage. Marcardio and I plan to do this, but we run out of time. After several hours in a cramped van driving out into the desert, our coyote, our border crossing guide, tells us to duck down and wait. He walks ahead, then motions down low with one arm, and we all run as fast as we can to and through a seven-foot barbed wire fence. We run across a sand road and through another barbed wire fence and keep running until we can't breathe anymore. Now we walk quickly as the fun sun finishes setting. We ran at least 10 more times through other tall wood and barbed wire fences. My mouth gets dry quickly as I hike, and I drink through a gallon of water every three hours. I carry five gallons of water and several bottles of Gatorade. 
We walk quickly without talking, just breathing hard and thinking. I think of the mountains to our right and how the desert might be beautiful under different circumstances. I hear a dog bark and think of the towns to our left and how the people living there are likely asleep and comfortable. Marcardio tells me we're in Arizona now, but I don't see any difference. After hiking four more hours, we stop in a dried up creek bed where there are no hidden cactus spines when we sit down. We sit in a circle, a few people pull out food and we all share it. We rub garlic on our shoes to scare away the rattlesnakes and a few of us ready slingshots in our hands. We pull cactus spines out of our shins from cacti we hadn't seen in the dark night. After hiking and riding another hour, we hear a helicopter. We try to hide under tall cacti. Joaquin tells me not to look at the chopper because it can see my eyes. I remember that native Mexican hunters in southern Mexico were using flashlights at dusk to find the eyes of rabbits to shoot them. I feel like a rabbit, vulnerable and hunted. Mark Harding hides under a cactus that has a rattlesnake rattling at him, but he doesn't move for fear of being seen, and the helicopter flies off. After hiking through blisters for several more hours, we stop to rest. We fall asleep in the creek bed under torn open plastic trash bags. Suddenly, two Border Patrol agents run to our creek bed, jump down inside, and point guns at us. They tell us in Spanish to put up our hands and not to move. One says to me in English, this doesn't look good for you, with a bunch of illegals. That year, in the Tucson sector of the border alone, over 500 people died. And we know from recent public health research that over the last 21 years, more and more people have been dying each year crossing the border even though less and less people have been trying to cross. So each individual person in the desert is at much greater risk of dying. One policy was enacted 21 years ago, the North American Free Trade Agreement, which opened Mexico up to a flood of cheap corn imports from the United States and forced many rural Mexicans to immigrate in order for them and their families to survive. Another policy has been in effect roughly that same period of time, and it's a U.S. Border Patrol policy called Prevention Through Deterrence. Prevention Through Deterrence involves Border Patrol agents being um, stationed at the most safe border crossing areas and leaving the most dangerous areas open. In, its, in essence, encouraging people to take the most dangerous areas that are where they're more likely to die. The second thing that migrant farm workers taught me is that unequal hierarchies make us sick. In U.S. agriculture, the kind of job you have relates to your citizenship and your ethnicity. If you are an undocumented Mexican citizen in the U.S., you're more likely to be picking berries bent over. Obviously, these body positions and kinds of work relate to health. But this isn't just on one farm, and it's not just in agriculture. You can think of other ways in our society that ethnicity, gender, citizenship relate to what kinds of jobs and what kind of health people have. Dr. Samuelson, a physician in the migrant clinic near the farm where we worked, told me, I see an awful lot of people just wearing out, 40-something or late 30s or early 50s. They're just worn out. They've been used and abused and worked physically harder than anybody should be expected to work for that number of years. Then they come out with this nagging back pain. You work it up, but it's not getting better. You give them an MRI scan, and their back is toast. In their early 40s, they have the arthritis of a 70-year-old, and they're not getting better. They're told, sorry, go back to what you're doing, and they're stuck. They're screwed in a word, and it's tragic. After my first week picking on the farm, I asked a bunch of the farm workers what their experiences were like. One of the young female pickers told me that her knees, back, and hips were always hurting, and her friend standing with her told, told me that she could no longer feel anything in her body at all. Abelino, who was a native Mexican father of four living in a shack near me in the labor camp, explained, you pick with both hands at once, bent over, kneeling like this, and you literally knelt all the way down. Your back hurts, you get knee pains, and pain here, and touched his hip. When it rains, you get pretty mad, but you have to keep picking. They don't give lunch breaks. You have to work every day like that to make anything. You suffer a lot at work. During my field work, I picked two days a week, and the other days I did interviews and observations in the clinic with farm executives, the managers, area residents. 
and I gained bodily data such as knee, back, and hip pain. In many ways, I didn't fit in the hierarchy on the farm. I was a US citizen and I was white, but I was picking berries and living in the labor camp. The farm executives recognized that I was someone out of place, and when they were walking through the fields, they would often pick into my bucket to help me keep up and joke with me, asking questions like, are you still glad you chose to pick? On the other hand, the native Mexican pickers treated me with a mixture of respect and suspicion. Um, many of them wondered why there was a gabacho chaca, a bald-headed white American, picking berries with them. There was a rumor that I was a spy for the Border Patrol or the federal government or the police. There was also a rumor that I was a drug smuggler who was hiding out from the Border Patrol or the federal government or the police. <laughs> and one day after eating dinner in his labor camp shack, one of the native Mexicans, um, Samuel, told me, right now you and I are the same, we're poor but later you'll be rich and live, live in a luxury house, a casa de lucro. And I explained, no, I don't want to live in a luxury house, I want a simple little house. And honestly, in my head, was picturing a little craftsman house in Spokane, where I grew up, or in Seattle, where I went to college, or in Berkeley, where I went to grad school. And Samuel clarified his understanding of hierarchy, saying, but you'll have a bathroom on the inside, right? The third thing that migrant farm workers taught me is that unequal narratives make us sick, and they keep us from fixing these problems. I'd like to give you a few examples. There's a narrative of choice that's often used related to immigration and border deaths. For example, a former head of the Border Patrol speaking about the people who had died at the border stated, quote, they chose to take on unnecessary risks. In a way, this narrative of choice is used to blame the people for their own deaths without recognizing the North American Free Trade Agreement or prevention through deterrence and how they might play in, much less the role of the United States in that. There's also a narrative of choice often used in medicine and public health working with populations like this. Uh, for example, one of the people who had uh, hurt his knee in the work seven days a week bending over was told by a physician you bend over it correctly, as though it was just a simple choice for him to bend differently, though it was seven days a week all day long. The second narrative I want to bring up is the idea of skilled versus unskilled labor. In the United States, we have a legal definition of what unskilled or low-skilled labor is, and it would include manual labor like picking strawberries. It would not include being a physician and being an anthropologist teaching at a university. My experience picking strawberries twice a week for two different summer seasons is that no matter how hard I picked and no matter how much I tried to convince myself that every strawberry would let my family survive better, I was never able to keep up with the native Mexicans picking up. But I was allowed to keep my job on the farm because I didn't fit in in the hierarchy. If I hadn't picked the minimum wage when I was a native Mexican worker, I would have been fired and kicked out of the camp. So it looks to me like the definition of unskilled or low-skilled labor doesn't actually have much to do with skill at all, although that then determines who, as an immigrant, has the right to come to the US. It has a lot more to do with what we as a society value, and it looks like we don't value very much the labor that goes into providing us with the food we eat. The third narrative that I'd like to bring up is that of naturalization. And when I say naturalization, I don't mean immigration policy naturalization. I mean the ways in which we come to think that inequalities like this are natural. For example, assumptions about different ethnic groups and their bodies. When I asked a social worker why native Mexican people had only berry picking jobs in the region, she explained, a los Oaxaqueños les gusta trabajar agachados. Oaxacans like to work best over. Native Mexicans like to work bent over. Whereas she told me other workers get too many pains if they work in the field. Later I asked the farm's apple crop manager why I hadn't noticed very many Native Mexicans picking apples, which is the field job with the highest pay. And he explained, they're too short to reach apples. They're too slow. They have to use ladders a lot more than some of the other guys. And besides, they don't like ladders anyway. He continued that Native Mexicans are perfect for picking berries, quote, because they're lower to the ground, unquote. 
So these assumptions of body difference along ethnic lines serve to make people think that different kinds of people deserve different kinds of jobs and livelihoods, and therefore deserve the different kinds of health and sickness that come from that. Since I migrated with farm workers, and they taught me these important lessons and other lessons, now when I sit down to enjoy fresh fruit and vegetables, I can't help but think of the hands of the people who grew them and harvested them and let them have them. And I notice how connected we are, even though there are these differences between us. My wish is that we as voters will speak up against unequal policies that make some people have to leave their homes and cross dangerous deserts in order for their families to survive. That we as eaters would choose to buy food from farms that treat their workers well, including farms that have United Farm Workers contracts or the Equitable Food Initiative label, and that we as friends and neighbors would challenge unequal narratives of choice, skill, naturalization, or other unequal narratives that we hear when people are trying to make sense of who's sick and why. In this way, we can work together with coalitions of different kinds of people to have a more equal and more healthy Yakima Valley, Washington State, the United States of America.